Hello, I'm Daniel Rohr with Fortaline Waterworks here in Mesa. We're going to be doing a valve demonstration with our clay valve rep. How's it going? I'm Jamin Jackson. I'm with uh, ESI, which is a clay valve company. We're going to go over a couple of valves that we have here today. So, starting out, what we have, real simple right here, is clay valve's main valve. This is, uh, as it's set up right now, is a pressure reducing valve. This one you'll see in most applications out in the field. The way this valve works is you'll have the inlet side here. As we know this would be the inlet side, we have a brass tag typically right here on it, or we can tell by the uh, pilot that's on the valve. Simple running through how this valve works is you have a diaphragm that seats on a disc. They'll, as the water comes in, it lifts the seat up, and as the water's coming through, the pilot's controlling what happens with this diaphragm. So we'll use an example of this valve set for reducing down to 60 PSI. If this valve starts to exceed the 60 PSI, it'll back up water, pushing it through onto the cover, and it closes down this diaphragm and pinches down the flow. Once we meet the requirements of the valve and it's holding that 60, it'll modulate and regulate where it needs to be. And simple as that is, water's coming back out. Water on the cover shuts the valve down, water off the cover opens the valve up. Next valve we have from Valvematic is a plug valve. We'll have a seating side and a downstream side. The simple way this valve works is you got a rotating disc or seat on the inside that allows room if you have any solids built up. We can use this application in wastewater, for air, water. That way if you have any kind of solids blocking up, it's not getting in the way of a disc. Another way of seeing it, other side, is it rotates out of the way, allows for solids to move by without jamming up, blocking the disc on the seat. Simple actuation, open and close. Next valve we have here from Valmatic is gonna be a butterfly valve. One thing to notice when you're looking at the valve in the cutaway is if we are seat on disc. So this is a simple valve. If you gotta replace the seat, you pull the valve out of line. You would undo the four bolts on this one, remove the retainers, then you have your seating rubber that you would take and replace. Uh, there would be some simple sealant and silicone that go right back on it, and then you're back in service after that. You can throw it right back in line and run. You don't have to send it off to do any millions or service of the actual seat on body. Uh, again, very simple valve, simple operation. There is more videos online at Valmatic where they offer servicing on it as well. Another valve we have here, this one's uh, it can be a swing check uh, or surge buster. This one's real simple in operation. You have your inlet side here as the water comes in, pushes the disc closed, so that'd be reverse flow. As you're coming in, this is your inlet side. As the water flows by, disc lifts up, allowing everything to go by. Another thing we have with this one is this plug down here. You can remove the plug. We offer a tool that comes in and it'll lift up this seat and allow you to go in reverse flow if needed for applications. On top, we have a plug that can be removed and it has an indicator that will ride right here on the disc that will tell you if the valve's open or closed when it is flowing. Simple, what's great about this valve is you don't have to remove it out of line. You can service the valve, rebuild it by just undoing the cover. Once you take the cover off, you can replace the, the seal on the top, replace your disc, and rebuild and you're off and running again. We have a ARV here, combination of ARV. Again, simple op operations. Floats up, down. We have offer rebuild kits, replaces the button here, the disc on the bottom, stem and seat up here on the top. Great valves, simple to use. Here we have another gate valve. It's a much larger example of the one just downstream of this system, but or excuse me, upstream. Um, so that's a gate valve and you can see it's a 12 inch, should be indicated, yep, right here, 12 inch. And you can see where the gate would seat. Right now it's fully open. This one has a non-rising stem, so you would have to get on it and turn it just to make sure. And that's upstream or downstream of a control valve. You can see this control valve here. 
the water comes in, pushes the diaphragm open, and when the pilot gets an indication the pressure has changed, it can, it can uh, cause it to close. So I wanted you to see actually installed. We have a butterfly valve here and it's on a automated or a control mechanism. So software, control software, will have this open and close depending on what the control software sees appropriate. Anything that's happening in the system, it can react to it by throttling that butterfly valve. Right next to it, and just upstream, is another control valve, very much like the one uh, we saw in the demonstration over at Fortaline Mesa. Here we see another butterfly valve, and you see the handle at the top. It's in line with the pipe, indicating that it's open. If it was, this is a quarter turn valve, so if it was closed, it would be at a 90 degree angle um, and per, away from the pipe. And interesting enough, and we've already talked about these in a previous video, this is a vertical turbine centrifugal pump, rather small one, but just like other vertical turbine centrifugal pumps, builds up a lot of head, head pressure very, very quickly. We see more butterfly valves, control valves, quite a complicated setup here. Here we have a gate valve just upstream of another control valve. So that gate valve has a wheel on it, but you can see what makes a gate valve different is it can completely isolate. We don't want to use a gate valve for throttling flow. It'll damage the gate and the seat if we throttle the flow, the force of the water rushing by will basically erode it away. Um, but that gate slides up and down out of the flow. Now, the thing about a gate valve is when it's fully open, it has the least resistance. It provides the least um, friction loss. But you see here another gate valve or another control valve just downstream. So here we see a double check valve assembly it's four inch. To the right there you see the dump or the relief vent, also called a drain. Isolation valves on both sides of these checks, upstream and downstream. <laughs> I'm right, in a, right next to a tree here. You can see the two checks. So as the water com comes in, the springs on the checks are rated for a certain PSI. Water comes in, pushes the first check open, goes through that uh, check assembly to the second one. If uh, we get back pressure onto this double check valve system, it'll slam those checks closed and dump water out the other side. What we have here is a pressure vacuum breaker. See the flow of water comes up from below, goes through the breaker <clears throat> and discharges from this side. Now you can see from the valve positioning here, this one is perpendicular to the pipe. So this is closed. This one is in line with the pipe. So it's open. These are quarter turn valves. Here we have the test ports, and this is one of those devices that should be inspected every year. It's a lot of brass. So this video, um, this is the lecture, well, this is the answers part. <laughs> We're going through the homework. Uh, we're gonna go through each question one at a time. We'll answer those questions. In the rest of the video that you guys weren't present for, videotaped a bunch of valves. That's why we call this hands-on. Real valves, did some video, did some explanation, and I'm going to make some explanations as we 
answer the questions as always because I like to talk. <laughs> Number one, what type of gate valve is used for underground applications? Let's start over here. Uh, underground, that'd be B, non-rising stem. Non-rising stem. So some gate valves have a non-rising stem and they're perfect for underground applications because to get to them, we have to open a, typically a valve box, right? These are gate valves that are used out in the distribution system, usually at one end of the street to the other, along a distribution line, distribution main, uh, a well fill line, transmission main. All these water mains have these isolation valves. The purpose for these valves is to make sure that we can isolate to repair the system, isolate to flush the system. Um, there's, and, it, and it's key that we have these isolation valves in place. Otherwise, if we have a 12 inch main and there's no isolation valves for a mile, imagine we have to make a repair. Mm -hmm. So to determine how much water is gonna be left when we cut open that pipe, if you could imagine a mile is 5,280 feet in length, right? So we do a little bit math, 0.785 times one, because it's, if it's a 12 inch diameter, that would be one foot. So 0.785 times one, times one, times 5,280 feet per mile, times 7.48 7 gallons per cubic foot. So we're taking this equation that's determining or calculating out how many square feet are in that pipe, and then converting that to gallons all in one equation. A lot of water. And so if you can imagine, hey, I've got to repair this pipe. I have isolation valves, but they're a mile apart. Here's some quick math. Let's figure out how much water is in there. How much water are we dealing with? How much water is going to pour out of here before I can even get to work? Mm -hmm. Once we cut the pipe, once we release that water. And that's a pretty good sized pipe. That's a lot of water. And remember, water weighs 8.34 pounds per gallon. So imagine being the guy that's cutting the pipe. Mm. Probably under pressure, even though it's isolated on both sides because that water is pretty heavy, right? So, what's the average? Great. What's the average psi? Usually sixty to seventy. Yeah, you know we like to keep our distribution system twenty around sixty <laughs> to seventy. Twenty is the minimum. Twenty is the minimum because we don't want intrusion. You know, um, really a lot of water appliances, like uh, water heaters and RO systems, it's good if they have 30, 35 PSI, you know. So we do wanna keep the pressure up because if the pressure is up to 60 to 70 PSI in the distribution system, when our customers and, and users go to, for example, go use the shower, you like to, when you bathe, when you shower, you like to have a little pressure behind that, that water that's coming out of the shower head. It makes you feel like you can rinse off better, right? So. <clears throat> um, it's nice that, you know, if you have the garden hose, nice if you, and you're washing your car, you know, you want to have some pressure there. Mm -hmm. So, and I see most of us here in this room live in this system. So we want to see the pressure up 60, 70 PSI. Yeah. Now 70 PSI is about the limit because once you start getting more than that, if you start getting to that 90, 100, 110, your water using appliances sure. and fixtures can, it can shorten their service life. It can wear them out faster because they're having to deal with more pressure than they're really designed for. Yeah. They can take it for a while, a couple years, three years, four years, but after a while, it gets old really quick. Mm -hmm. uh, it wears them down. So number two, the primary purpose of check valves is to prevent. Now, one of my students, there's one reason why we're doing this, one of my students pointed out that I had two correct answers there. And this is not one of those situations like you'll encounter on an ABC certification exam where there may be more than one correct answer, but one will clearly stand out as the best answer. So keep that in mind as you're taking your exams. When you're taking your exams, you read a question and the choices that are available to you because these are all multiple choice questions. What's the best answer? 
that's the correct answer. And based on your experience, training, and studying, you'll be able to discern which is the best answer. Now, in this case, you could have said A, loss of prime, or B, or excuse me, C, water from flowing in two directions, Both which true. is another one, way of saying when you only want water flow, when you want water flowing in one direction only, which is more typical. Um, A or C is the correct answer. Um, and one of the reasons why we're doing this, this is the initial, you know, we haven't made all these videos and study guides public yet, really. They're just available to certain few certain people is so I can make that correction. What I meant for this to be was C. So when the study guides come out, A is going to be something completely different. But check valves, like we were saying, a check valve is usually downstream of a pump. When the pump shuts off, it closes and allows water to remain in the balloon, keeping the balloon of the pump primed. Um, water from flowing in two directions. We only want water to flow in one direction. And typically, that's typical throughout our entire distribution system until you get into, like, say, neighborhoods where the water fills those lines. You know, a lot of people believe that and can imagine that water is racing through our distribution system very, very quickly. We don't want that. We don't want water rushing through our system very, very quickly. The reason why is because when you get around 10 feet per second, water creates friction as it's flowing through pipe. And when you get around 10 feet per second, it's eroding away the inside of the pipe. You know, um, four feet, five feet, six feet per second is much better. Yeah. And if you can imagine the water is in the distribution mains that are running right down the middle of your street with service lines branching off to, to each residence, right? So the water, the pipe is full of water. As soon as somebody flushes a toilet, a few gallons of water rushes into that service line to replace what's being flushed down the toilet. When that happens, the water that's right there around that service line can get moved into the service line. Otherwise, we generally want the water just moving one direction through the distribution system. Number three, how is pressure affected on each side of a butterfly valve? On that, that would be high pressure upstream and low pressure downstream. Very good. And the reason why is because the butterfly valve, the closure element, it's like a butterfly wing. That's why they call it that way, right? So and we have to remember the closure element on valves, that's how valves are named. It's, it's in accordance with the operation of the closure element. A gate valve slides down. It's a, it acts like a gate. Um, so in this case, a butterfly valve, it's, it's on a center axis, and it's a quarter turn valve. So when you have the pipe running in one direction, and the handle is facing at a 90 degree angle to the pipe, well, that means it's closed. When the handle is moved, and it's running along the pipe, if the handle is right on top of the pipe, and and aligned with it, that means the valve is open. Oh, yeah. And that's true for all valves that have a handle. So because the closure element is on an axis right through the center of the valve case or the valve body, it's in, it still remains in the flow. So when the valve is closed, it stops the flow. When the valve is open, its profile is to the upstreams the water coming past it has to push back. So it's it's causing back pressure. There's friction loss there. Anything that's in the pipe blocking the, any amount of water from flowing nice and smoothly down the pipe causes back pressure. So the butterfly valve causes back pressure. A gate valve, when fully open, is completely out of the flow of water. So that valve has the least resistance of all other valves. Butterfly valve, it's at a profile, the water's hitting that side and going around it. So you have 
Higher pressure on the upstream side, lower pressure on the downstream side. Number four, which valve can be used to throttle flows? D, butterfly valve. Butterfly valve. It's very good at throttling flows. It can throttle flows without the valve or the closure element becoming damaged. Unlike a gate valve. A gate valve is designed for throttling, throttling flows because the flow, the water rushing past the gate can erode the sides of the gate and damage it. And we've seen that, haven't we? Yeah. Just a few, what was that, last Thursday? Mm -hmm. I think it was last Thursday night, and that's four or five nights ago. We, um, we had a valve that was free spinning. We went to, I think we went to close it. We went to isolate that no, valve. Was, uh, opening it. We were opening it, and, and, it, kept going. and it just kept spinning. Spinning, spinning. So we know that the internal gears, and this is a non-rising stem, so so you can't just look at you just can't look at the stem and and say oh it's open or closed. Mm -hmm. We didn't really know the operator who was spinning that valve wasn't really sure at first if it was stuck open or stuck closed, and because we were using that gate valve to throttle flow for for quite a while, mm -hmm. which it's not designed to do, but it's convenient in the situation that we're in with that with that part of the collection system or the force main that it's on. Um, <clears throat> the threads within where the stem has to, the threads are all housed inside and the stem or the, the threads are all locked into place. So when you spin that, it doesn't have to rise. The stem doesn't have to rise, it, mm -hmm. but it moves open and closed um, because it is in a valve box and it's just below grade, it's, it's hardly, six inches, eight inches below grade, I yeah. think is the, the valve nut. So very shallow. Yeah, very, very shallow. So when it started spinning freely, fortunately it was open, we can we can deal with that. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't holding back water from downstream. And we were able to isolate that line, um, shut down the lift station. There was two lift stations that feed that force main, which is not ideal at all, but it's given the situation that we have. Um, so we were able to isolate that, that force main. And because that gate valve happened to be at the high point on the force main, we didn't have to hydro back when they opened up the bonnet. However, what we did encounter was back siphonage, mm -hmm. which is a topic that we've discussed already and we're gonna discuss more later on. Um, back siphonage is, is as the water is receding in the pipe and is emptying, something has to take the place. If, some, if, if air doesn't replace water as it recedes, what do we have? Okay. We have a vacuum. No, vacuum, negative pressure. Negative pressure. So our crew that was out there, the contractor that we um, asked to complete this for us, and, and we could have done the job ourselves, but mm -hmm. you know, because of the company policy that we work with, it's much better um, to employ contractors in this, especially with the liability and things like that. But we were all right there. We all watched what they did. They started to unfold the bonnet and they pulled it back a little bit because they were testing for a vacuum. And sure enough, air started being sucked in between the bonnet, the gasket, and the valve body. And so they gave that, and it took several minutes, four or five minutes for that to finally equalize before they could remove all the bolts, remove the bonnet, and all we did is we left the valve body in place. We never cut the pipe, which this is a huge benefit. <clears throat> we never cut the pipe. We removed the bonnet, which included the stem and the gate, the closure element. We removed all that, and we had an identical gate valve in our critical spares that we took the bonnet and the gate out of that unit and slipped it into the valve body of the one that was already bolted in place. It was a 20 minute job, mm -hmm. which is great, especially when you have two lift stations on the same force main. You don't have a lot of time. And we were not in peak, but we were headed towards Close peak. To we were probably 45 minutes away from peak. Yeah. So, and that means during peak, water more water starts to flow through the system as people 
at that time of day, people were on their way home from work, on their way home from school, and we know what happens then. People get home, <clears throat> they want something to drink, maybe they want to take a shower, maybe they want to cook dinner, maybe they're doing laundry, washing dishes, things like that. So as we get into peak, those kind of activities are happening. People are using a lot more water because they're getting home. All right. So the answer, butterfly. Number five. Oh, look at that. I made a mistake there. I'm going to fix that too. Well, it's going to be in the video. It's forever in the video. <laughs> this stuff happens, right? Not going to stress it. Number five, which valve of the choices below is operated automatically? I put C, altitude valve. Altitude valve, that's very good. It's a control valve. It's an altitude valve. It's designed, and, and these, these control valves are designed to either act under certain conditions automatically because of the way they're designed. And some of these valves, some of these control valves receive a signal, maybe even from different locations, you know, not even right there at the same site. So it might be pressure, like a ground storage tank filling with water. There might be a pressure transducer at the bottom of that thing. And when it measures that a certain pressure, say 10 PSI, it knows that, hey, we just hit the fill. It sends a signal, you know, that's, that, that's what we call a set point. And once it hits that set point, it sends a signal to the valve to close. It's an on-off signal. So, altitude valve, and that's the exact example. Water gets to a certain level, a certain altitude, a certain elevation, or a certain pressure is how we measure that. Then it either shuts off, or if the water drains down to a certain level and the pressure drops to a certain level, the set point is to uh, start pumping. So you start pumping or start filling when it's low, when it gets high, the pump shut off. <clears throat> and we know that, well, for every foot of water is 0.433 PSI. 0.433 PSI per foot. We saw that in our math uh, assignment. Mm -hmm. 0.433 PSI per foot. So we can program in, our controls engineers can program in that, hey, when it gets to 10, 10 PSI, it's about what, 22 feet, 22 and a half feet? Yeah, roughly. And maybe that's the set point where it's supposed to stop. Stop filling. So we don't actually have a measurement in feet or inches or meters, but it's a measurement in pressure. Mm -hmm. The pressure is the set point. Number six, which valve can be used to throttle flows? A globe. A globe. Maybe. So you remember question number four, mm -hmm. which, which valve can be used to throttle flows? And globe wasn't on there, but butterfly was. You can have the same question with four completely different choices. And that happened to me once. Out of all 16 exams, the only one I failed, I got a 69, 70 is passing, on a grade three wastewater treatment. And after I took that exam, I went back, I studied, I studied, I signed up to take the exam again, I went back and passed the exam, but I noticed that one of the questions that I knew I had to study, they asked a question and they had four choices. And I remembered it after I got home and studied. But when I went back to test again, I had the same question, four completely different choices. And that always stuck out to me. So I just want to make sure you folks are prepared for a situation like that. So which valve can be used to throttle flows? Globe valve? That is correct. The closure element on this is if you can imagine you have a sphere or a globe and the very top has a, um, a, a stem on it that lowers onto the seat and because it's round, water can flow around it pretty well. That between the globe and the seat. So you can use that to throttle flows. Number seven, these valves are best placed at high elevations where air tends to accumulate in distribution system piping. A, 
ARVs. ARVs, air release valves. Air release valves. Yeah, Am I, it's not PRVs? It's not PRVs, no. It's an ARV, an air release valve. Keep in mind that a pipe. We don't want air in a main. We don't want air in a pipe that's pressurized. If it's a gravity sewer or an open ditch or an open canal, it doesn't matter. Gravity moves that water. But when we need to move pre water to higher elevations or far distances in a short period of time, it's pressurized pipe. Those are our water mains, our distribution mains, or things like that. So what we're doing is if we have air in the line, air gets stuck at the high points. And when it gets stuck at high points, and because it's compressible, the force of the water flowing through there keeps that air right there in that high point in that pocket. And if it's allowed to stay there, it reduces the diameter of the pipe. So if you have a 12 inch diameter pipe and a bunch of air in a pocket, all of a sudden you have a 10 inch diameter pipe. Mm -hmm. So if you can imagine, you have a 12 inch pipe, then it gets reduced down to a smaller diameter, and then it gets, pops back open again to 12 inch. What's that gonna do to your pump curve on your pumps? What's that gonna do to the expectation of the GPMs that you can deliver into your system to maintain pressure? It's gonna reduce everything. It's gonna reduce it. It's gonna wreak havoc on your system. Mm -hmm. So if you have a main that comes up to a high point, drops back down, it's a perfect placement for an ARV, especially a combo or a combination air release valve. Where it allows in and out. It, exactly. So what that allows for is the air to escape. Once the air is done escaping, the valve body fills with water and it closes. There's a, there's a mechanism that once that floats up to the top of the valve case or the inside of the valve body and it keeps the water inside after letting the air out. Now let's imagine there's a line break. Somebody, somehow the line got broke. Usually it's some contractor who wasn't paying attention to blue stake or didn't call in blue stake, mm. hit, the, hit the main. Now the water's trying to rush out. As the water empties, it's emptying the pipe. So the water is rushing, and we just talked about this a little while ago. It, when the water is receding, it's emptying out of the pipe. If there's no air entering the pipe, it's gonna create a vacuum. If the vacuum is strong enough, it's gonna crush the pipe from the inside because it's a vacuum. It'll just collapse the pipe, which now you've got some serious problems because you gotta replace a lot of pipe. And we don't keep that amount of pipe. It could be 60 feet, it could be 600 feet. Could be we don't keep that much pipe on hand and that's hard to get right now, especially post COVID. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody with any experience about that, you know what I mean. So. So a combination air release valve will allow air in. It's got an orifice that, and the design is, if air is in the pipe, it allows the air out, keeps the water in. As soon as the water drains away, then the element opens up, and if a vacuum is behind it, there's less pressure in the valve body, it'll suck air into the line, replacing or, or, or let's say um, not allowing a vacuum to build. Mm -hmm. You'll have somewhat of a vacuum because like in the example I gave you, you have a 12 inch diameter pipe and a combo ARV, it's only got a two inch or three inch opening. It's gonna, it's, it is gonna develop a partial vacuum, but it's gonna allow enough air in to keep it relieved, hopefully before it crushes. Number nine, what is the most common valve used in the distribution system? I put C, ball. Ball. Ball and plug valves. These are the valves that usually two and a half inches in diameter or smaller. Um, we have our service lines, three quarter, one inch, two inch for the... Irrigations. Yeah, irrigations. And then uh, the also the properties, the acreage properties. Yeah that have uh, horses and cattle and things like that. So <clears throat> these ball and plug valves, these are the ball and, these are the valves that are just upstream of the water meter. 
in our distribution system. So every customer with the meter typically has a baller plugged out just upstream. You know, some of these we call them angle stops. We've gotten pretty good at replacing those out. Yeah. So, and they come in various sizes, various styles, things like that. So, um, it's a ball valve, an angle stop. And the cool thing about those is those are quarter turn as well. They're quarter turn valves. Number nine, why are gate valves used in a water distribution system? That would be isolate parts of the system for repairs. Exactly. You want to be able to isolate small parts of the system. And in, in, while we're talking about that, let's just talk about, okay, we're in a neighborhood somewhere. We have to isolate. Maybe we have to change out an angle stop. Hmm. We have to change out an angle stop, and that means we're going to have to shut down all the customers on one street. So we'll go around, we'll knock on doors, let them know what's going on, the people that are home. We'll call our dispatch and let them know that, hey, we're shutting down this street. There's gonna be a certain number of customers that are affected. If anybody calls, let them know. We'll have the water back on within two hours. In our system, two hours is our limit. That's when we shut down, make repairs, and get it back into service within two hours. Um, so we isolate that line. We replace the angle stop. Get a new one on there, get everything hooked back up then, and put it back into service again. Now, hopefully this is a looped system, which means that the neighborhood up the street and the neighborhood down the street and that the rest of that system, when we isolate that one line, it only affects those customers. But everybody else will have water coming in from two directions. And what that means is we have water that flows into a neighborhood, typically from one direction. It flows through the neighborhood and leaves out another pipe to the next street, the next neighborhood, the next main that's taking water somewhere else. Now, if we isolate one of those, then the other side will feed it. And so when they say that the distribution system is designed to, for water to flow in one direction, um, it's true, that's the intent, but it, in this, in, in cases like that, it's it's going to the customer. It's from our distribution main to them to to the customer. It's maintaining water within that neighborhood, within that development, within that distribution system by allowing it to come in from two directions. So if we isolate one valve and one valve only, then water will hit that and make its way, and water from the other side will fill in the gaps. When we shut down a neighborhood, we're stopping the water just in that neighborhood and everybody around it is still getting water. Number 10, this is an area bounded by a lower elevation and an upper elevation, which receives water from one source. Pressure zone. Pressure zone, very good. So we have an area out here, that's the perfect example of a pressure zone. So we have an area <clears throat> that is at a lower elevation than the ground storage tank where the water feeds the distribution system from uh, booster pumps. But in that same system, there are customers at a higher elevation. So we, and they're about the same elevation as the ground storage tank. So we have customers up on a high point and in the same system, we have customers at a lower elevation. I believe it's only about eight feet, something, eight to 12 feet, something like that. But see, eight to 12 feet can be a big deal to a booster pump station with how much pressure. Now, again, we like to maintain our pressures between 20 and 70 PSI. Minimum is 20, we don't ever wanna drop below 20. So, because we have a system that's a lower elevation than the other part of the system, we call that a pressure zone, we want to maintain pressures and, and really that limits the pressure that we can Send. provide to the system that's upstream mm -hmm. or at a higher elevation. So we limit that pressure down there and unfortunately we got to be around 85 PSI to deliver 50 PSI at the higher elevation. Mm -hmm. 
So if we drop below 85 PSI, let's say we go to 70, the people or the customers at the higher elevation might only be getting 30, 35 PSI. That's not really that and that's gonna cause complaints. It's gonna make people unhappy. I personally don't want 35 PSI at my residence. No. So that's a pressure zone. And that PRV is a pressure reducing valve is what help, uh, allows us to, to isolate off a pressure zone or determine where that pressure zone is. Yeah. Number 11, in the event of a line break, this component will allow air into the pipe to prevent a vacuum. I'm gonna say D, combination ARV. Combination ARV is correct. Number 12, valves should be exercised on a regular schedule. I mean, once per year. Annually, once per year. That, that's the way it should be. 13, when fully open, this valve will exert the least friction loss of all valves. Gate, gate valve. Gate valve, very good. 14, these valves react to changes in the system by controlling flow, automatically opening and closing valves to compensate for those changes. You got a number a little differently on there. Do I? It's, yeah, you went 12 to 14 right away. Yeah. It's the same kind of question though, but. Oh, 13 was the gate valve? Yeah, 13 uh, that's, that's 12. Really? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Keep going in line. You're so still good. when fully open, this valve is your, it's a gate valve. The yeah. next one is these valves react to changes in the system by controlling flow, automatically opening and closing valves to compensate for those changes. That is? B, control valves. Control valves. Oh, I see. 15 and. No. Oh. That's all right. Keep going. So, and this is number 16, right? This question? Uh, when a valve will no, not close 15. by using the hand wheel, use a cheater bar? Yeah, that, well, it's false on that one, but this one here is on 15 on the sheet, so that's okay. So I just misnumbered. Yeah, okay. you're fine. Stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> when a valve will not close by using a hand wheel, use a cheater bar. You said it's yeah, false. Ne never use never ever bar. use a cheater bar. Why? That access will happen, you will break something, you will hurt yourself and or damage the yeah. equipment. You can snap the stems, yep. the threaded stem on a on a valve. And if you snap it, it immediately needs to be replaced, most likely. <laughs> yeah. Especially with our luck out here, right? <laughs> yeah. It's never it, except for the other day when it locked in the open position at a high point in the system that wasn't holding water back up against it. Mm -hmm. We were able we got that was good. It was lucky. It was nice. It went really, really well. I was really happy with that because most often times something like that breaks at 3.30 on that, what day? Uh, the, the forbidden day, Friday. The for, Yeah, the forbidden day. The day that we, for the longest time, my crew wouldn't even say Friday because it was bad luck. And if so it's a three-day weekend. Oh, God. Yeah, no. No. Yeah. Flashbacks. I believe that's it. Yep, that was. So I'm sorry about misnumbering this on the presentation. In the PDFs, they'll be numbered correctly. Sweet. I thought I had that down. I remember actually working on that one and thinking it was it was good. Thanks a lot, guys. I pre oh, when you see this video break on YouTube, you're gonna see a bunch of videos with ARVs and other valves. Uh, that'll be the hands-on portion. Sweet. I want to thank Daniel with Borderline Mesa and uh, Jamin. Jamin, yeah, sorry, I'm terrible with names. With uh, ESI yeah. for making this possible to bring in the cutaways. Um, appreciate everything. You'll never ever see in my videos anybody, a contractor or a vendor that I don't work with. So these guys have been really great with the utility I work with and uh, especially helpful with me today. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, appreciate it. All right.